I am privileged because I know quite a lot of people in here. When I came down to the students' union, to the trade unions, and there are loads of people come up to me and said, I remember you 30 years ago. I thought, oh, <laughs> oh, so I have that skin yeah. now. <laughs> but I am lucky and I am proud that I was a miner's wife and a miner's daughter. I grew up in a mining family. And I don't care what anybody says that we lost to us women who stood out for a whole year and me three years along with some more wives that husbands were in prison and did the Justice for Mine Workers campaign and uh, release our political prisoners and victimised miners. I mean we spent years after the strike but I am proud that I was one of them because as Terry said we kept them communities going for a whole year without any money because I think even families with three and four children the state only gave you £16 a week and that's all you got. The miners were considered to get nothing at all unless they went away picketing and they were given £3 a day weren't they to live on. But we fundraised we travelled the globe and I was one of the lucky ones. America, Belgium, Germany, Denmark. I literally travelled the globe to fundraise and bring money home, get that message out. And there were thousands of women like us. Now, the first part of the strike, when I first went, and was asked to go to a meeting, I thought, blimey, it's London. Do you know, I'd never been on a train on my own in my life. Now, that sounds silly at 30, but I hadn't. I'd been with my family. I'd never actually got on a train on my own. And there I was, a year later, tootling off to America on my own. <laughs> and you know what? It gave women that power that if you want to, you can get up and you can go out there and you can do exactly what you want. You know, you do not have to be that little wife at home. Though I do have to say I was married at first to a male chauvinist <laughs> who you will help in the strike because it's going to be a long one. Halfway through, when he came back off a picket in for a week, said, where are you going? I said, oh, I'm off to Belgium with the girls. <laughs> you can't because you've got to wash these clothes and you, you're not going. A big rat, I said, well, too late, and I just walked out the door. And a week later, when I come back, and he said, and I've been down that strike centre and I've told him, you're not here. You're not coming again. He said, you, if you can't be home washing my clothes and cooking, and that is a serious problem, though, and I went down the strike set and they went. I said, I'll ah, take the notice of him, he's got a monk on because you don't know how to use a washing machine. <laughs> and he didn't. So I wrote it on a piece of paper and I stuck it. <laughs> but I wasn't the only one because there were thousands of women that had never actually, when I bumped into the Welsh girls, they'd never been out of the valleys. You know, they'd never been up into London and up north. And it was brilliant to see these women. And when we started this campaign up in Sheffield with the um, Women Against Pit Closures, delegations from all of the pits, I love our lovely photo at home of it, there were women there that was their first time ever out of their little villages and towns. And I am glad it's still now running it has given a lot of people, they now carried on, do other political things, like we never heard about Nelson Mandela till I stood at South African Gate in the strike. Then I went and read about it. I went to Ireland, women against strip search, because then women were having a bad time getting in and out of their prisons, the same as I was with finding Terry in which prison he was in. And it brought organisations together and under that miners' banner, 
was socialist, revolutionary, communist, all under a great big umbrella, NUM. And what was saddened after that, it seemed to just disintegrate. Mm. And all the left-wing parties started rowing and arguing. So as I went on and on, and I've got people coming to me saying, will you do this meeting, will you? Oh, you can't go and talk to them. I said, I can talk to who I like. I'm women against pit closures. I am now victimised minors, trying to get compensation for the sat minors, for the imprisoned minors. I said, you, you, what happened to the little umbrella? It, it just fell apart, didn't it? And I, it's not because we lost, because I don't consider I lost. Not one little bit. I think perhaps Fleet Street might have lent a hand with their rubbish that some of them printed. But I didn't hold it against them, I stood on their picket lines. I was up there at Wapping. I was at the seafarers' strike, helping them out with their soup kitchens, telling them where to go, where they could get a trade union movement to help them fundraise. And I carried on. I do have to say, after about five years, I did want to go back in my little house. I decorated it for one, because it looked like a little tip. And I did settle back down, but it took me then five years of doing what I did. And I was proud of all them women in that strike, and I'm proud of the women now that still care about racism and things that are going on. And I wish now I'd stayed out there, but I tell you what, I was worn out. I literally wore myself out traveling. And now I was the 20th anniversary I've done, the 25th, and now I'm doing the 30th. And I hope I'm still around when the next big one comes around. Because whatever you say, at the end of the day, us women in that strike were marvellous. And I take that as well. Like you haven't heard enough of my voice. I am not a singer by any stretch of the imagination. So if you want to leave now, you can. <laughs> but this song was wrote by a Kent Miner's wife. It's called Cold Not Dough, and it sums up what happened to us. And you'll have to excuse me because I'm not very good at singing. Right. It stands so proud, the wheel so still, a ghost like figure on the hill. It seems so strange, there is no sound. Now there are no men underground. What will become of this pit yard? Where men once trampled faces hard, so tired and weary their shifts done. Never having seen the sun, will it become a sacred ground? Foreign tourists gazing round, asking if when what asking if men once worked here, way beneath this pit head gear. Empty trucks once filled with coal, lined up like men on the dole. Will they be ever used again? Or left for scrap just like the men? There'll always be a happy hour For those with money, jobs and power They'll never realise the hurt They cause to men they treat like dirt Empty trucks once filled with coal Lined up like men on the dole Will they be ever used again Or left for scrap just like the men? Well.